Um, it's really organized today. I'm with Tracy, so she's quite organized. <laughs> she makes sure there's some order. I'm a little bit disorganized. <laughs> yeah, I would wing it quite a bit. Tracy normally sorts things out, so I don't have to wing it. Yeah, today, um, just while we were worshiping, I just, I just got a picture of, of an old family Bible. This is not part of the preach at all. It, and and uh, just relate to that for a second. It's normally a musty, big, doc, big tome that sits on a coffee table somewhere, and everyone refers to the family Bible. And the names of the kids as they're born are all written up in it, and that's about it. It never gets opened otherwise. And I just saw this Bible opening up, and the Holy Spirit just flowing out of it. And just the more it was opened, the stronger this Holy Spirit just became and just flowed and flowed. And I just thought there's a message there for us as a church. Open the word. God wants to flow. So, yeah, it's just, you know, it's just a starter. Yeah, um, <laughs> we're going <laughs> to... We're going to share a bit of just our walk in Nazna today. So it's going to be a bit of our backgrounds quickly, um, how we made our decision to come to Nazna. Um, then a bit of uh, our journey here in Nazna in terms of the business, our loss of the business, and then the consequences of that. And then a bit of just God's restoration. I, I just call it God's rebuild plan. You, know, you see these cars that they rebuild on television. Well, this is something even better than that. And then just some overriding impressions and lessons. So I'm going to kick off without further ado. We'll be swapping and chopping and changing between the two of us. My background, I, I grew up in Zim. Um, lived through a bush war up there. My dad was one month in the army, one month out. So it was pretty hectic in terms of family life. Um, but I really, from an early age knew that God was in control and he was in charge. I mean, for example, my dad hit a landmine in an unprotected vehicle once, and he lived. There was no issues, no, no injury whatsoever. I think he lost his glasses. It was the worst thing that happened. Um, we were mortared four times as a little, a little town, five times as a little town. We were on the Mozambique border, and no one ever got injured in the whole, in the whole town. So we just saw God's, God's hand over that. And, and so I had a deep-seated relationship between God and myself. It was... It was, it was deep, it was strong. Um, over the next 20 years, I still believed in God. I didn't pay much notice to the guys on the other side of me. So I've got this belief in God. I was saved in 78. In 79, we immigrated to South Africa. I then, when I matriculated, I became a mining engineer, a coal mining engineer. And I worked on the mines from 83 to 2004. And in 2005, we moved down to Nisner. And I've either worked in Nisner or I've commuted ever since. Um, that's a bit about me. I'm going to hand over to Tracy now. And just before we start, I kind of felt that Hebrews 11:6, without faith it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and he, that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. And um, just a bit about me. I grew up in the southern suburbs of Johannesburg. We had a, an amazing um, family life of my dad worked seven to five and then he worked extra hours jobs to keep us going and my mom was a stay-at-home mom we were privileged enough to have our folks with us through our life and my dad would drop us off on a Sunday at church and read the paper in the car so he did his duty <laughs> and we heard God and um, then I thought I was getting left on the shelf and I wouldn't ever meet anyone and I met this amazing man next to me when um, really was a good dad right from the word go even Though we, once, as soon as we got married, we moved off to the mines, a very naive young girl, very, 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 very quiet. So just sitting here is God's, um, is already a big thing. And um, the privilege of being a staying, I was a priv also had the privilege of being a stay-at-home mom, and Wayne worked incredibly long hours. And uh, so that, for, that was the drawback for our family. And we went to church on our own. We did sporting events on our own, we did school events on our own, and, but when Wayne was there, he was a really good dad. He changed nappies, guys. He, <laughs> he might I didn't get up at night, eh? <laughs> don't let them brainwash you too much. <laughs> he, he didn't get up at night, but he was a good dad. And our holidays, we, we couldn't wait for our holidays, because those were, Wayne would take off his watch, switch off his cell phone, and we would have undivided attention. And so we lived for our holidays. I believed God, I wanted more. I wanted to be baptized. I baptized myself in the bath, and <laughs> we were provided well for. 
And every Sunday, the boys would say, Dad, will you come to church? No, not this Sunday, maybe next Sunday. Dad, will you come to church? No, not this Sunday, maybe next Sunday. And All right, so that's just a bit of our introduction. We're going to chop and chop and change like this. We've practiced this a couple of times, but uh, I'm the one who normally goes too far, so we, <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, so in 1984, well, after 20 years on the mines, 2004, I, I looked around and thought, what am I doing? Um, Tracy lost her brother in a car accident. It was a tragic event. She really felt like she was never going to smile again, and yet when she went to the funeral, she just got a calm and a peaceness over her. Um, at that stage, it made me examine what was I doing with my life, how was I living past my family. So I'd always wanted to work for myself at about the age of a 40, and I was close enough to that as to make no damn difference. So I said, well, let's go. I didn't know what I was going to do. I resigned. Um, I wasn't led by God, that's for sure. Uh, it was my own decision, but God obviously had other plans in that decision, and we'll get to a bit more of those plans later on. But nevertheless, I resigned in 2004. I was then looking for something to do. I didn't have work. I didn't have a business lined up. And on my travels, I, I went down to Cape Town. I was investigating some business opportunities down there. And I attended a Josh Jen meeting uh, one night with my brother-in-law and sister-in-law. And I rededicated my life to Christ in November 2004. Um, and then after that, we select, selected a business in Nasna, and we moved down to Nasna. Tracy will tell you a little bit of a story, or well, she won't tell you the story. Coming to Nasna, we had to go through a couple of processes uh, which involved uh, a hot dog stand, burvo stand, um, a gift shop. Fortunately, we failed quickly at that and uh, moved on, and then we made our way to Nasna. God started to work and to bring to reality. I had a conversation with my dad and saying when we were staying in Secunda, that everything was going so amazingly well. We had this beautiful home. We had the boys were doing well. And um, we, were, we had, we had um, pay, a house paid for. We had the most amazing holidays. But there was still something missing. And actually just saying, but, but Dad, I feel really nervous because it feels like things are going too well. And he would say, but there, but by the grace of God, go I and just enjoy the season that you're in. And... Um, just as Wayne was saying now, you know, that my brother passed away and that peace came over me and I just knew that God was in control of everything. And even though we didn't feel it at the time, which was really scary because Wayne kind of was one day on the mine and the next day he was giving up and everyone was saying, he's just going through a midlife crisis, don't worry, he'll come right, he'll come around. But I knew that something diff was different. And God started to move us in a, on a journey to Nazna, which involved a caravan a really old caravan with burvos. And we only got the caravan 80 k's down the road. We gave that idea up. <laughs> the gift shop, we only ran for two days, and I gave that idea <laughs> Yeah. All right, so we moved down here in Easter of 2005. We'd selected a small business here, and we opened in May 2005 as a going concern. We ran the shop more or less successfully for four and a half years. When I say more or less successfully, turnover kept on increasing for the first four and a half years that we ran it. Um, despite that, though, I did spend six months or eight months in 2006 commuting. It was a bit of a cash flow issue, so I, I ran a mine up in Pumalanga. It's enough about businesses for the time being. In terms of church, the first weekend we arrived in Nasda, we went to a traditional church, a church that we'd been married out of, um, a congregation, and I just said to Trace, no, that ain't going to work, so we ducked there. And the second weekend, we, we moved to a small church in a tennis club. Um, and we've been with that church ever since. Uh, it's, uh, it's been great, yeah. Um, one of the, the lasting memories to me was moving from the tennis club to this venue. It was sort of, okay, guys, we're doing church today. Everyone pick up a chair, put it in the back of your car, and we'll meet you across at the school. And 40 minutes later, we all moved, and, the, and we had church here. Yeah, it was just fantastic, yeah. And so that, that family feeling that working together as a church was great. It came through. Nevertheless, I was still a 931-1101 guy. And those guys who are 931-1101 guys, you know what I'm talking about. You pitch up here at 931, everything's set up. 1101, you get up and you duck and don't let anyone talk to you. you know, it's too vulnerable. You're a little bit too close to the bone when people are that close to you. I will say one guy persevered like anything. It's old Charles who set up the church in, in Plett. And every week he'd, he'd walk me to the car, say, cheers, don't you want a cup of coffee? No, thanks. Sometime later, maybe, ciao. 
One day, Ali came to see me, and I thought, who's this dude? I didn't even realize him, recognize him from the church. You know, I've been there for a while. But then I did this commute thing for six months in 2006, or for eight months. When I came back, I found my family, really. I, I came back once a month. But during that period, I really found my family, knitted into church, into a home group, <clears throat> at prayer group. And we just, uh, we just experienced God's love there. Um, I saw a, a blossoming of family life. The kids were in the church, which was great. So it was really something good that we saw. You know? Moving on to the business, as I said, it was, it, it was semi-stable up to about October 2008. That's the first time I saw a dip in the turnover since I'd taken over the business. Cash flow dried up a bit, and by September 2009, there was no more money. So I then started commuting, and I worked a job down in, uh, um, down in Peter Teef. Um, yeah, that was, that, was, that was really tough, but I just want to give an indication of some of the things that happened during that time. From in January 2009, I had, a, I had a son that had to go to university. I wanted to go to university. He'd been accepted. Um, as I said, cash flow started drying up in, in October 2008. January 2009, and I needed 20,000 rand to put this boy into varsity, and I had no money. Lutu, nuts, zip. I just paid bonuses. I had nothing. Not, a, not, not five cents to wrap together. For about three or four months before that, I'd been trying to sell my motorbike, and to no avail, nobody had money to buy a motorbike. So I was asking God, Lord, I need to, we need to sort this thing out. This boy needs to go. In two weeks' time, he's got to be at Varsity. Um, my then shop manager came into the shop on one Monday morning, and he said, is that motorbike still for sale? I said, yes, it is. He says, I've got a brother-in-law in Newcastle who'd like to buy it. So I said, well, you know, the, the price is the price. He said, yeah, no, you'll buy it. Or on my say-so. I said, well, talk is cheap, money buys the whiskey, put the money in the account. That afternoon, the money was in the account. The next morning, I dropped it off in East London. The boy picked it up from Newcastle, and I had the money, praise God. You know, so it just, you know, God just came through, boom, it just happened. It just was like, I didn't do anything. Um, another sort of lesson, a bit of testimony. In 2009, it was kind of tough. We had no money for anything, and, but we really saw God's love in people's actions. I mean, I remember one day coming home and uh, opening the fridge, and the fridge had been stocked while we were out. People had got into our house and just stocked it with food. It was just God's love in action. Um, saw gifts to my son for varsity. I saw tanks of petrol donated. I just saw, I got counsel for dealing with the fallout in the, in the business. Really wise counsel in terms of how to progress, what to do. I partnered with a guy called Alan. We worked through that for a while, and there were a lot of, lot of interesting discussions there. Yeah. Um, I then got a job in Peter Teef uh, in about September when their money really ran out in 2009, where I was away for a month, and then I'd come back for a three-day weekend, and then I'd be away for a month again. Um, and during that time, I left the shop with Tracy. Uh, we only had, we had two key guys in the shop, and we were battling to make this thing work. And we were battling and battling. And I was praying out to God. I was just saying, "What must I do? What is the next step? We want to do the honourable thing, but how do we do this thing? Please give us a sign." Unbeknownst to me, on that same weekend, Alan had been praying as well, saying, "Lord, give us a sign. Give us a sign. What what must Dwayne do with his business?" The Monday morning, the, these two key guys pitched up at the shop and said to Tracy, we are here. We want to, to leave immediately and go to the competition, effective immediately. So I phoned Al, I phoned Trace. I said, well, close it down. Alan had actually been praying that one of them would leave, and that was enough of a sign for him to close it down. God came through and said, boom, boom, off you go, close the place down. And we closed it down. You know, and even in that, that demand of theirs that they wanted to leave immediately, just God just honored that. It, it was, there, was no, there was no retrenchment packages required, no minimum payouts to them that we wanted to close the business and had to retrench. It was just it was God's hand. But what I saw the most was the sign that we demanded, God came out immediately and delivered. And there'll be more on that a little bit later. So Wayne spoke about the business, and I was left to run the business, which was really, really, really tough. Um, we were knitted into the church which I thank God for every day. Um, 
just, it, I think God was really toughening me up in such a big way that I would never, ever, ever have been able to deal with the things that I did. Just this thing called local church that God holds on to so dearly. We saw and we know that we know that we know local church is key in our lives. Nick and Viv, Shaul and Di, Alan and Susie, Paul absolutely blew us away with, um, in every possible way you could imagine. I mean, I remember crying out to God in our bed and saying, God, how are we going to send Travis to varsity? Because we just didn't have the finances. And Paul, who was earning a really meager salary, brought a thousand rand and put it in an envelope. And that was the day that I just knew that God would make a way. If he was going to send someone like Paul, that he could do amazing things. Nick and Viv and Alan and Susie and Sean and I were there we were with, with words of encouragement with words of kindness, love, scripture. We were prayed for. We were fasted over. I just know that this thing called local church, God provided in such a way. Just um, Joshua needed a guitar, case cover, and I remember crying out to God and saying, God, you've promised that for our kids there would be enough. And somebody came to us and offered us a guitar case for a rand. So I had a guitar case for his birthday present. Um, right down to 100 rand on our windscreen, down to 600, Wayne finding 600 rand in his, suit, in, his, in his pants pocket. So every single need was met every single day. And when we had to move from our house, um, I was working in the business, and 11 buckies, the, on the morning of the removals, 11 buckies pitched up and removed every stitch that we had moved. They moved it to the house that we are moving to. And just let me tell you that this is God's hand because we actually moved to Leisure Island. We, I'd actually, <laughs> for a whole year, we were actually able to stay there. And just at three o'clock, the house was packed out. The, the pictures were up. It was just an amazing, amazing, amazing thing of this local church. Yeah, we've moved a couple of times in our lives. And it was the best, the best move ever. We moved, we started at half past six in the morning because we had to be off that Samola Hill, they had the Samola Hill climb. We had to be off the hill at nine o'clock. So all the trucks were off the hill at nine o'clock. By half past one, we were set up in Leisure Isle and we had lunch for everybody. I'm talking about pictures on the walls, stuff packed in the cupboards. Alas, Kudun Khadan. And we've had professional movers. They didn't work like those others. It was, it was, we that, that was the family that we were in, yeah. We were actually trying to think of a slogan, the Nasna Movers, or something. We were trying to think of something. SGCI really really Movers <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and Shakers. And the scripture that I held on to through that was, but for God, sorry, Isaiah 43, verse 18, but forget all that. It is nothing compared to what I'm going to do. For what I'm about to do, something new. See, I've already begun. Do you not see it? I'll make a pathway through the wilderness. I'll create rivers in the dry wasteland. Yeah, so, you know, you might ask, well, what is this lost business consequence? You know, what, what was it? Before I came to Nisner, I had two houses paid for. I had a fat pension, and I managed to put a couple of million rand into this business. So when I'd lost everything, we lost the house, which at that stage was bonded for one and a half million, 1.6 million. We lost the business, as I said, there was about two, two and a half million in there. I'd lost my pension that was in both the business and the house. So we were flat broke. We had, we, we, when I say we lost everything, we lost everything financially. Um, we sold our business. That was a blessing in itself. We, just, we had a guy who was prepared to buy it, and the money we got from that settled about three quarters of our creditors. The other quarter of the creditors we paid off over the next 12 to 18 months. So we settled everybody. We auctioned our house off. It was a soft auction. That was a stage that the, the banks were going through. And of that 1.6 million, we had an outstanding uh, bill of 300,000, which we paid off on an interest-free loan over the next six to seven years. We're paying for that at the moment, but no interest payable. So when we left, the net result was we had nothing in terms of property, bar a six-year-old Corolla and a battered Hilux Bucky. That's what, we, that's what we left with. And then I want to get a bit onto God's rebuild. Before I go there, let me give Tracy. I've always loved Wayne, but things were tough between us. God started to restore us as a family, 
and we cried out for our marriage, we cried out for our relationships, we were prayed, we fasted, and we got counsel. And God's promises were starting to, to become a reality. And just that thing of God saying, put, down, put my kingdom first, and all the rest will be added unto you. When we sent our boys off to varsity, we, we asked them to do the same thing as get knitted into a local church. And um, I wrote this down. It says, dream, he gives you the desires of your heart. Submit to him and he changes your heart and your dreams become what he intended for us. And once again, I held on to, one of the scriptures I held on to was Isaiah 40, verse 28. Have you never heard? Have you never understood? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the earth. He never grows weak or weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Even youths will become weak and tired, and young men will fall in exhaustion. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar on wings like eagles, and they will run and not grow weary, and they will walk and not faint. And that was his promise to us. Yeah, just as Tracy hung on to certain scriptures, so did I. Um, but I was also very honest with God. I'll never forget driving down Velbeduck Road one day, shouting out, crying out, crying, literally crying, and praying to God at the same time. Just saying, Lord, what do you want to do? What must I do? Where next? What now? And that honesty was, was, was something that I've seen before with David. If you read some of the Psalms, he shouts out, Lord, where are you? Why are you abandoning me? me? My enemies are upon me. Where are you? And at the, by the end of the Psalm, you just see David saying, thank you, Lord, you've, you've, you've come through. Um, yeah, so I was honest with God, but he was equally honest back. I had strong counsel from people, from friends, but friends who I knew loved me, who knew me well enough to bring some, some home truths to roost and then expect action to be taken. And I think, you know, Tracy's just alluded to, to local church. That is what local church is about. If you're bound in, if you're intimate with people, you know that they actually carry your best interests at heart. And even when they give you harsh words, you know that it's only out of love. So it was, you know, it was really good. One scripture, as Tracy alluded to it now, but one scripture I held on to is Matthew 6, 25 to 34. And I'm just going to read through it quickly. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more of more value than this? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. And you know, I'm, I'm driving one day, I left a mate of mine behind in Secunda, and I was living up, I didn't have a permanent employment all this time, sometimes I, I would take a contract, sometimes I would be out of contract. So I'm sitting in Secunda one day, I had been working down in Petra Teef, and, uh, but I'd, I'd left them, and I'm sitting in Secunda, and I get this thing, go to Petra Teef. And I say to God, hey, but Lord, I don't have lots of money to, to splurge on this 400k trip. You know, I'm driving this diesel bucky. It's an old battered bucky. It's running costs so high. <laughs> Lord, I, I don't have lots of money to spend on this, and you know I don't have work. He just says, "But get your A into G and move." So I, I started driving. I put on a, a, a New Testament. I had some New Testament CDs, which I put into my, which I was listening to on the CD player in the bucky. And it, this scripture, or one very similar to it, came up. Don't worry, I will provide. I drove, and, I, and it's a two and a half hour trip down to Petra Teef. And I was driving, and I was thinking, Lord, you know, I'm not going to get work there. I've just left those guys. There might be some work, but the guy phones me and says, how about working for me for six months? We'll see if we can get something going. So I said, yeah, I think that's a good idea. Let's see what comes up. 
by the time I got to Peter Teeth, he had phoned me back and said he wants to see me in like four hours' time in Whitbank. So I said, cool, no problem. I was, saw the guys at Peter Teeth. There was no work at Peter Teeth. I jumped in my buck here and I started driving towards Whitbank. I got to Ermelo. Somebody else phoned me and said he's got a six-month contract job that he'd like me to come and do. So I said, cool, no problem. I can do that. By the time I got to Whitbank, which is another 150 k's away, another guy had phoned me and said he's got a, just a three-month little contract that he'd like to put together. When we do a study on, on, on some contractors versus, versus own mining. And I'd, I'd done some similar work previously, so it was easy money, chop chop. So, in literally in four and a half hours, five hours, I suddenly had three jobs on my plate for the next six months. And that's just, you know, that's this Matthew 6 thing. You know, it's, yeah. Another, another scripture which we really held on to, and I just want to turn to it. It's, it's, it's in. Uh, you guys don't have to turn because it's, it's quite a, a hefty tome. It's just a, a piece out of Jeremiah, in Jeremiah 32. Now, Jeremiah's in jail at the time <laughs> that this happens. He's in, he's in jail. The, Jerusalem's under siege. His cousin comes to him and says, Listen, but I've got a piece of ground I want to sell you. But it's like occupied by the enemy. <laughs> it's outside the walls of, the, of Jerusalem. It's occupied by the enemy, but I want to know, will you buy this piece of ground from me? Like, like Jeremiah is thinking, but before Jeremiah gets told that, God says to him, hey, your cousin's going to come to you and he's going to make you this offer and I want you to take it. So he says, okay, cool, let's see if my cousin comes. His cousin pitches, boom, he has a piece of ground, do you want it? So he buys it. I mean, this is craziness. This, this thing is occupied. Why am I buying this piece of ground? And I got this scripture which I held on to just around Nasna and, and what's happening in Nasna. I got it on the 23rd of January 2009. This is before all the stuff, it was in the midst of all the stuff going down, but by now, I hadn't yet gone to work up in Joburg permanently. The business was right, battling, and yet I want to just go through it. Jeremiah, just some of the headings. Jeremiah buys a field, and then God speaks to Jeremiah and says, Houses and fields and vineyards shall be possessed again in this land. God's assurance of the people's return. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? And he reiterates it again. And fields will be bought in this land of which you say it is desolate, without man or beast. Men will buy fields for money, sign deeds and seal them and take witness in the land of Benjamin, in the places around Jerusalem. So God just comes back to him two or three times in the same chapter saying, don't worry, you've bought it, you've sealed it, it's, 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 it's locked up in this little wax seal. Don't worry, it's yours. It will be restored to you. You know, and I just, that to me was craziness. I'm bu- God's asked me to hang on here in Nasna, but on what grounds? And, and I just saw this thing. And then I've looked at the years since 2009, because this, this came to me at the beginning of 2009, 2010, 2011, and 2012. And I've just seen, I've, I've managed through that to put one and a half sons through university. When I say one and a half, the one is halfway through, the other one is full way through. So it's sort of one and a half. But I mean, the last two years... We've put them through university, all debts paid. Nobody owes anything. They're both Christians that are into a church in Stellenbosch. We've actually got one of their elders who's thinking of popping in for lunch this afternoon. Wow. It's, you know, um, we've knit into a loving community. I've experienced the care, the growing in faith. I've done a couple of outreaches. It's absolutely fantastic. I've seen God work in other people's lives. This afternoon, I heard a, this morning, I heard a testimony from a young guy who's trusting to go to a Youth for Christ week up in Johannesburg. He's, he, he, he's not a rich kid. He prayed for it. He's, he's got it. It's all expenses paid, 1500 bucks done, deal. Poof. Now we just prayed this morning for transport up there. Now that's just God's evidence of, his, of how he's working is around us all the time. And then, you know, just I suppose the next question would always be, well, Man, that's all cool, and you know you've got your life together spiritually, but uh, where do you stand financially? About two months ago now, my boss came to me and said, "Listen, we, we need to cut some some costs at work." So they're looking at cookies and tea and stuff like that. And I said, "No, guys, you you're wasting your time. You need to amalgamate some of these management boards, put them together." So he said, "Yeah, well, maybe we'll do that." Three weeks later, he came back to me and said, "It's a good idea, my yellow salmon ichluani." You're not part of the plan. So I said, oh, well, this is, this is, this is, these things happen. But we're going to make it worth your while, you know, to, 
to leave us and whatever else. And they've, they, they've paid me out a, a six-month cost to company payment, which includes their pen, pension contribution, their medical aid contribution. Um, so I've got a six-month severance package. I've got a bonus on top of that, an annual bonus that will be coming up. And I have my pension on top of that. So that all puts together a lump sum, which, which is God's way of, of restoring me financially. I was crying out a couple of months ago. I said, Lord, how am I ever going to be able to afford to do anything without getting into debt again? How am I going to be able to stand up? And boom, bang, boom, poof. Here it is. And that's just, that's the God we serve. This time around, it's just going to be with, with guidance, counsel. It'll be a different, a different walk. But it's just fantastic that God loves us enough to even sort out our material stuff. Yeah, and a couple of other things. I think he's just led us to, to dream again. And, and to have the courage to stand up and, and seize that tree. <clears throat> Nick preached a couple of weeks ago about, about dreaming, and in 2013, dreaming and then seizing that tree. And by the end of 2013, standing with something substantive in the hands, with the bushels of, of, the, of the harvest in the hand. And I really believe that God is allowing that to happen again. Um, he's also... <laughs> He's also allowed me to write a couple of things recently, and that's great. I think we are multidimensional, multifaceted, and God wants us to, to live like that. We're not one-dimensional. The world would push us into a little mold, into a little description of, of, of who you are. It's funny how commonly you say to somebody, so what do you do just after you've met them? And he'll answer, he does his job. Whereas he should be saying, I'm father to two sons, I'm married to a beautiful wife. I live in Nasna. You know, it's just but people don't. They say, I'm a mining engineer. That's all that you are. You're something very different to that. So, you know, I think that's what God has done in terms of the restoration for me. I'm going to hand over to Tracy for her, her perspective. Um, there are many breakthroughs that stand out, and one of them is, is worship for me. I can stand in front here, dance and sing, and praise God for what he's done in our lives especially um, as, as a family, I think we can see what God has done in, for Wayne is a huge thing, you know, just to know that Wayne actually washes dishes, cooks, makes food. Hey, I make master bread. <laughs> <laughs> makes bread, and he's there for our family in a big way. And my, 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 my kitchen god is Jan Braai. So I can stand here and boast in the Lord and say he is good and his favor on our lives. And we didn't keep our house and we didn't keep our business. And believe me, we cried out to God for that. But I know that if God says, let it go, let it go, because he has something so much better for you. And just as we have had so much better for us. God has a plan to prosper and not to harm us. And we're living in that today. His provisions and his blessings and his mercies are on each of us. The God I serve is the God of the miraculous and the God of restoration. Trusting God is not easy. Just for Jeremiah, he publicly bought land that was already in the enemy camp, but he believed God and he trusted God. David, it was also not easy for David to believe God, to trust God, but he believed that he would become king even after he was anointed. Just for Moses, Moses also had to trust God and believe that the people from Egypt would be set free. Even after the burning bush, it wasn't easy for him, but he trusted God. It isn't easy for all of us to believe the impossible either, but we must trust God. The God I serve is the God of the miraculous. Do you know him? Every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord and Savior. Maybe today is the day that you need to accept him as Jesus, your Savior. Yeah, I think, thanks, Tress. Overriding lessons, impressions. I think first and foremost, God won't drop you. He's a God of love. He's a God of courage, support. He will not drop you. You've seen that through and through. You might not trust him all the time, but he won't drop you. I just get the picture of Peter walking on the water, one step ahead of the other, and he walked on the water. God won't drop you. That's the first point. 
Second point, God works on character. In the front of my, in the front of my Bible, I wrote a couple of issues down that, that God's actually addressed in me over this, over this walk. One of them was this self-sufficiency, independence mindset. You know, we, we grow up like that. You cleave to your wife, you, off you go, and you make a life for yourselves, and you do whatever is required because you are self-sufficient. You are the provider. God wants to be your provider. He wants you to rely on him. Another one is pursuing peace. I can be, I suppose, if you put it nicely, cantankerous. I suppose it would be the right term. <laughs> Pursue peace. I've got it in the front of my Bible. That's, it's, it's just a, a thing that came through. Gentle but firm. Something that I needed to do in my business. So he works on character. He won't drop you and he works on your character. And the last one, which I really believe, God restores more than you lost. He restored for us, he restored family, he's restored security, and he's given us joy. I, I love it. I know what the result of the end game is. How can we, how can we not be happy? So yeah, just a, a really good time. You know, we, we've learned a lot, and uh, I praise God for it. Can we pray? Father God, we, we just thank you for your bounty in our lives, Lord. Thank you for your hand that strokes us, calms us and soothes us, for the way you direct our paths, for the courage you put into our breasts, for the love you've given, Lord, for your son that you put on the, on the cross, Father. He laid down his life for, for worthless manhood, Lord. And Lord, it's so that we would commune with you. And Father, I just pray, Lord, that this testimony today would go out, Lord, and just, just as that picture of the Holy Spirit coming out of the, coming out of the Bible was given at the beginning, Lord, I pray that this testimony would just release the Holy Spirit into lives, Father. That fear would be abandoned, that hope would be rekindled, that glowing embers of faith would be, would be pushed into flame, Lord, into rapid flame, Father. Father, I thank you for your grace in our lives, for your loving us continuously, and for the journeys you take us on, Father. You make us bigger and stronger at the end, and it's because of you. Father, be with us today as we enjoy our time with our families, as we just enjoy time amongst one another. In Jesus' name, amen.